Hi, my name is Tony Zhao. I'm a research scientist at the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Institute of Technology. Today, I'll be telling you about the RNA world. All living organisms are made up of cells, and each cell is composed of a boundary made up of a phospholipid bilayer. Within each of these bilayer membranes is a genetic molecule, in this case DNA. DNA undergoes self-replication so that during cell division, more copies of itself can be transmitted to daughter cells. This process is catalyzed by protein enzymes. DNA can also be transcribed into RNA, a messenger molecule. This process again is catalyzed through protein enzymes. And finally, RNA is translated into proteins. Yet again, this process is catalyzed through protein enzymes. What we've just described here is called the central dogma. And this process of going from DNA to RNA to proteins is exhibited in all forms of modern life. The RNA world theory of the origin of life, where RNA can accomplish the same function as DNA, as it can store and pass down genetic information, because it is very similar in structure to DNA, as both DNA and RNA are made up of four different nitrogenous bases that can hydrogen bond to a complementary base. RNA can also take the function of proteins in that it can catalyze certain chemical processes when specific sequences of RNA are folded into complex tertiary structures and can catalyze these reactions. So in an early living system, let's consider one which contains a compartment, nutrients, the gene product, and a genetic material, which is RNA, that produces the gene product. Now, in order for this living system to replicate and evolve, the genetic material, RNA, must also in turn be able to replicate and evolve. And if this is possible, then subsequently this early genetic system can grow, evolve, and divide. Now let's focus on this process, the self-replication of RNA. To date, there are many potential ways by which this process has been postulated to have occurred on the early Earth. At some point in evolution, it's very likely that an RNA ribozyme, that is a catalytic RNA, that could catalyze the replication and polymerization of other RNA molecules would have been necessary for such a system to have been sustained. However, let's then now consider what would have happened before the emergence of such an RNA ribozyme? One possible way that RNA could have replicated is actually chemically in the absence of ribozymes. Now let's consider here a strand of RNA in blue, and as RNA is made up of many monomers that have been conjugated together, we see that different monomers can then bind to the RNA template based on the complementary sequence that the template exhibits. These mon monomers now bind to the RNA, and through a polymerization process, the monomers can then conjugate to each other, forming a polymer. This is the complementary RNA strand that's now been formed. This process can occur through various means, and one of the most reasonable proposed methods is through activated monomers. This is when a monomer is slightly activated by a leaving group, LG, and this actually catalyzes the extension of the complementary RNA strand so that it can incorporate new monomers. Once this polymerization process is completed, the entire complementary strand has been formed and basically the original RNA system has successfully 
replicated itself. This leaving group, this activated group of monomers, often has been postulated to occur through 2-methylimidazole, which is a very strong leaving group. Now, there are still some outstanding issues based upon this model of non-enzymatic replication of RNA. First of all, denaturation step. Once the complementary strand of RNA has been formed, how do you separate both of these strands so that each strand can now act as the new template for subsequent replication? If this denaturation process doesn't occur, then what you have is that all of the available RNA strands can no longer participate in a further round of replication once it has replicated one time. And this would be catastrophic for evolution. It's been postulated that there are some possible solutions, such as pH cycling to effect strand separation or reannealing, or even utilizing um, viscous solutions to keep the strands separated. Secondly, there are still some issues with the polymerization mechanism in this process. For example, some of the polymerization rates of these activated monomers is not so fast, and they're sometimes prone to degrading. One of the proposed solutions is that perhaps instead of a 2-methylimidazole leaving group, one could change to a 2-aminoimidazole leaving group. And this leaving group actually results in a much faster polymerization rate than the first generation leaving group activated monomer. It should be mentioned that all of the leaving groups that are being mentioned are laboratory analogs. It may not be true that real living systems on the early Earth use these exact leaving groups. However, these leaving groups do give us a way in the lab in the modern day to study how a model system could have replicated. Another issue that we must consider is degradation of RNA. As many people know, RNA is extremely labile to hydrolysis in that it very quickly degrades, especially when the solutions that it's residing in are not fully clean. One of the major sources of degradation in this replication system is magnesium. Magnesium cations are an essential step so that the polymerization step can occur, as it catalyzes this polymerization step. However, the same magnesium that catalyzes the polymerization also results in very rapid degradation of the RNA strands. One of the proposed mechanisms to get around this is to instead use different divalent cations, including iron. In this case, the iron used is iron 2, which is reduced iron, and all of these processes are required to be handled within a oxygenless chamber. This is because in the presence of oxygen, the iron 2 will oxidize into iron 3, and the process will no longer be able to occur. I've suggested here a few further readings. If you're interested in knowing more details about the origin of the RNA world or the specific components of the RNA world, please take a look at the first two references. There are also hypotheses within the scientific community that perhaps before the RNA world, there might have been a pre-RNA world that existed and emerged first. Finally, there is no reason to really expect that RNA and DNA should be confined to just four nucleobases. As recent research has shown, you can actually incorporate eight nucleobases into a replicating nucleic acid system. And so I've included that suggested reading at the very bottom here as well. 
Thank you very much. I hope you've learned a lot today about the origin of the RNA world.